It is the spooky month! And that means my subconscious is insistently prodding me towards trying to immerse myself in the world of horror movies. And what better way to do that than horror movie sim- I mean Dead by Daylight! Dead by Daylight is listed in the Steam store as survival horror, and I don't think a definition could be more apt, given the game centers around a horrific series of trials testing your mental fortitude, slowly breaking you down bit by bit, constantly giving you the feeling of an oppressive atmosphere and very little room for hope. Apparently, that's also very similar to the premise and the lore of the game itself, but the true horror, as any Dead by Daylight player should attest to, comes from the game itself. From the moment you load in, you're in a constant battle against the game and reality to keep from having a mental breakdown. Even just trying to get into a lobby with your friends can feel like a test of willpower, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My intentions with this video are to give an honest, accurate, logical, and holistic view of the game design philosophy of Dead by Daylight, along with some critiques and commentary on the community surrounding this game. And while talking about bugs or cheaters would be easy, it's not really the point. I hope that with this review, you can get a better sense of where the logic of the game's design leads, the way the community interacts with it, and what works versus what can be improved. And at the end, I'll give some of my raw feelings about the game. Who am I kidding? I'm maybe giving my raw feelings the entire time. To begin, in case you don't know, Dead by Daylight is a 1v4 PvP game. Unless you're playing solo online, in which case it's a 1v society in reality, where you have to pray to god that you loaded into a match with human beings, as opposed to mindless zombies, actual bots, or corpses who have accidentally slumped onto the ready up button upon death. I like to refer to the game as a horror movie simulator because it really seems that's what the game was designed to be, and the smash-like cast of horror movie icons the game harbors further attests to this. In this regard, I have to give the game praise. I really do think the game does a great job of giving this vibe, especially with the artistic aspects of its design, from just the atmosphere of each map to the descriptions behind perks and items. Not to mention, I can definitively look up a tier list pitting horror movie characters against each other. I'm genuinely a sucker for this kind of stuff. I didn't care that the meta of BB Tag was making two big circles on either side of the screen as Grim Reaper 1 and Grim Reaper 2. I just loved that I could put some poor sap's waifu from two different series to rest as Terami 1 and Terami 2. Now to actually get to the gameplay, Obviously, given it's a 1v4 scenario, your objective, depending on whether you choose killer or survivor, changes. If you're a killer, your objective is to... uh... well that's complicated. So you'd think, hey, the name says killer, so I imagine my job is to, you know, kill? And given the other side's called survivors, I imagine they probably want to be, you know, not kill? Maybe instead survive? So I can probably guess the conflict of objectives here lies in the fact I'm supposed to kill them, and they're supposed to instead survive, or vice versa if I'm a survivor. Well that's actually a topic of heated, and I mean heated, debate. Let's just look to the game for guidance, because often the best way to truly understand the objective of the game is in the design of the game. And where better to look than the end game screen, and there's no win or lose. Damn. Uh, wait a minute. There is a score page. Look, it lists everyone's score. Well, it looks like I got the highest score. Did I win? Well, wait a minute. Someone in chat is saying killer always gets more points. Oh, okay, uh... Well, actually, if you look, that score is really just the points you keep for spending on items that'll help you in later games. Oh, okay, here's the ranking system. Perfect. So, it says I got plus one. Nice! I won! Wait, wait, these YouTube videos are saying that getting rank 1 is incredibly easy. Uh. Oh yeah, and if you look, I could have gotten 0, so is that a tie? This must, must be minus 1 is a loss. Wait, what is plus 2 then? A double win? Oh, this video also says MMR is a thing, and is completely unrelated to rank. Interesting, uh, what influences Emma? It's kills, the number of kills you get. So, so wait. It was kills all along? But then why, of the three metrics I just mentioned, is kills the only one that doesn't benefit me in any way? Score gets me currency as a reward, rank also gets me currency as a reward. In fact, kills doesn't just not benefit me, it actually punishes me! Cause supposedly, later, my matches will be harder. Uh, wait a minute, 
Uh, what's this? Uh, hatch escape is not counted the same as a regular escape for this of MMR. Well, well, why? It's not like it's a mechanic that's more so based on chance or than anything actually skillful, right? Right? Why would they do that? Oh, and people are making videos saying the number of hooks you get is how well you did. But, but was it that kind of a factor in the other metrics? There's literally a section in each of these four hooks. Uh, uh, who am I supposed to believe? Oh, and don't even get me started on Survivor's definition of winning. So we have all of the same ones we just mentioned, kinda. We've got score, we've got rank, we've got... Wait, am I supposed to say my escape is all that matters? Or how many escapes my team gets? Uh, uh, well apparently MMR only cares about mine. Okay, so I guess I don't really have any connection to these other players aside from how they can benefit me. Oh, but tournaments, everyone on the survivor side is from the same team, and escaping together matters. Oh, okay. Wait, tournaments? Wait, why don't we just ask them? How do they do it? Is it score? No, surely it must be kills. What the... Uh, uh, what the... What in the hell is this? Oh, gosh. Uh, it's, it's, please, turn it off. Uh, oh, gosh. Why would someone let this happen? So suffice to say that when you load into a match of Dead by Daylight, the world is your oyster when it comes to picking your objective, and whatever constitutes to win to you is a win to you. Well, now that doesn't sound so bad, right? Wrong! Okay, I don't mean to be the fun police, and I'm sure some people will see me this way for saying this, but hear me out. There is, absolutely, nothing about a game having a definitive win condition that detriments the game, or the different ways people can play it. Just because other games have a win, loss, or final score at the end, doesn't mean that people playing those games can't have their own objectives within those games. Just to touch on the game I've centered my content around in the past, Overwatch, just because the game says win or loss at the end of each match, doesn't mean that players won't do things like unrated to T500 bastion only challenges, or try to accomplish weird plays, off-meta choices, or do specific quests for achievements or currency. Any player playing a game can always derive what they want from it, but having a definitive goal gives players structure. A competitive player can actually tell whether or not they are improving. A casual player can congratulate themselves on a success. And when people want to compete against their friends, or have a tournament, they don't have to create a nine-page document detailing how you specifically will run your tournament, as opposed to all others, just for the win condition itself. Now to segue a bit, I mentioned currency earlier, and how it can impact future games. And we aren't talking about cosmetics here, we're talking about those items, add-ons, and offerings that can completely change the way a game functions, akin to perks, which are also gained through blood points. Actually, can I begin by saying, can we stop this whole thing right here? This needs to stop. Listen, I don't know what you think is fun about this, but it's awful. When someone gets a game for the first time, they can expect to get their ass beat. Sure, they might run into someone who's just as green and new as they are, but most of the time they'll face people with slightly to significantly more experience than they have, giving them the edge. Why then do game developers feel the need to see this disparity in experience and immediately double down by completely nerfing the new player in every way conceivable? I won't even get into the fact that the new player has little to no items to bring. Let's talk specifically about perks. I completely, COMPLETELY understand hiding perks behind progression. That's actually cool and fun. I work hard at the game, and now I've unlocked something cool that lets me do something new. Sick. But what in the hell is all of this? First of all, why are the perks level 1 through 3? Why are there levels at all? What about having a lower level version of a perk is fun? When I'm a new player, and I have my stupid little perks I've gotten in the hour I've played, it doesn't feel cool to know that I'm at a disadvantage because even my version of those silly little perks is anywhere from barely to severely nerfed in comparison to the version a veteran player has. Not to mention that veteran players still probably wouldn't touch this perk with a 10-foot pole given they're running the same four perks every other survivor is. Oh, four! That's right, four perks! Yeah, you know, like a full kit? Sure is a shame I can only bring two, 
What a cool way to start the game. I have my awesome little nerf versions of some of the worst perks in the game, and I can only bring half as many of them as other players can. But wait, that experience isn't something that goes away when you're a veteran, because you gotta do this over and over and over again. Thank God I actually devised a strategy where I never have to do that again, but I imagine the average player just grins and bears it. Sick game design. Thank God you at least can't wallet warrior it like some other games, I think. Oh, oh, and I was supposed to be talking about consumable stuff. Yeah, uh, right. Okay, so this is pretty cool in some ways, but honestly pretty awful game design in other ways. And I'll get to my own personal take on why it's awful in a minute, but yeah, so you end the match, and you get points, and aside from doing a couple perk and a couple cosmetic things with them, they're primarily for consumables and to make future matches easier. This sounds like it could be alright, and honestly it could, but like... Here, let's look at it this way for a moment. This is Otstarva. This is an incredibly wholesome being of the fog who tries to make sure everyone is having a fun match when he plays, makes extensive in-depth looks at the game that honestly put the length of my videos to shame, and does insane challenges where he severely handicaps himself almost every single time. Some might think he's insane for doing these challenges with low tier killers, I thought he was insane for doing them without full builds, but now he even just stands still for a bit. Now, I do wonder if the psychology of survivors is impacted ever so slightly by the raw power of a man standing in place for 30 seconds before becoming a killing machine, but none of this takes away from the fact that the man is genuinely a beast. Something inhuman. Now, here is Ots a few days ago, finally breaking when it comes to broken items. Hello friends, this is Ots. For most of my killer streaks, I've always talked to the rule of not using any add-ons. But lately, some things are making me reconsider this idea. In particular, it's the amount of items and offerings that survivors bring on average. On average, it seems that my lobbies are full of often very strong items that are really difficult to keep up with. Moments like that made me want to reconsider, okay, maybe I should start running some add-ons to keep up with this, but it wasn't until yesterday that I played this dredge game that was so deeply frustrating, and I'm very embarrassed that I was tilted throughout the entire game, that at the end, I, I generally just changed my mind, and I've decided that from this point on, I'm not gonna hold back the same way. Even a king like this is brought down by the sheer power of items. In case you aren't piecing together what's going on here, the consumables you can bring to a match can range anywhere from barely impacting the match to having incredible ripple effects on how the match plays out. And at the higher MMRs, with veteran players, it's supposedly becoming more common and more meta for everyone to always have the best of the best when it comes to these consumables. I imagine that the extremely healthy changes they made to progression recently that helped with a problem with the insurmountable grind there is for perks may have sadly exacerbated this item problem. And it's making the gap between playing with these items and playing without them, as well as the gap of playing meta killers slash meta perks versus playing off meta killers and off meta perks, worse and worse, for both sides mind you. I think it's safe to say the game is much, much more fun when every survivor game isn't against Starstruck Nurse, and every killer game isn't against four deadhards and four medkits. And this brings me to a problem of... wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something else we need to address before that. Here, let me put a little tab in that. Remember that the items issue correlates to something I'll mention later, but first, another problem that correlates to the same issue. That's confusing. You'll see. Dead by Daylight. Surviving. What do you think the most powerful thing survivors can do is? Is it bringing a certain item? Is it a certain cosmetic that makes them harder to see, or a certain strategy for blending in? Is it always holding W and making the slower killers want to die inside? Yes, it's definitely that, but, but forget about that for now. Is it a certain perk build that just seems to win every game? Nope, it's an app, it's Discord. The strongest ally survivors have is Discord. I know there's some lore about, like, the entity helping killers, well, you could look at Discord as, like, the entity for survivors. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they put it in the lore at this point, given its influence on the game, except for the fact that the devs refuse to acknowledge the subject of player communication being vital to balancing this game in either direction. Okay, here, let me put it like this. A huge, 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 huge factor in how DVD plays out is how aware players are of what the killer is up to. Obviously, there are perks and abilities that try to stifle this knowledge, 
but the biggest boon to survivors' survivability, as well as to their efficiency, is Boon Discord Call. Dead by Daylight essentially boils down to a race to see who can complete their objectives faster, the killer or the survivors. The biggest way to boost the speed for the survivors is communication. If every survivor knows what the killer is up to, they don't have to fear him impeding their progress, even when they would normally suspect they're in danger. This means that the survivors can take the downtime they would normally have being afraid that the killer is a threat to them, and instead use it to keep completing their tasks. Uh, the generators. And so, obviously, the game devs must know that this is a staple of how the game works, right? Right? Kinda. Because they sure as hell make it seem that way with how many damn perks do absolutely nothing other than giving you info on the other players. But then, you may ask, why use those when I could just talk to my teammates? Why substitute those perk slots for just using my voice? Isn't that a waste of perk slots when I could just talk to my teammates? Well, you better know your teammates IRL, because there's no voice chat. It boggles my mind to even consider why DVD doesn't have voice chat, specifically when you consider two things. The fact that the game is already a slaughter fest about murder and no hope, and the fact that you already get death threats in the endgame chat regardless of whether or not you can hear people. I could honestly rant more on why in the hell there's no voice chat in the game, and honestly, it's probably the main question I have for the game's design philosophy, and probably the number one glaring flaw I see in the game, period, given it totally changes the way the game plays, changes the atmosphere, and ruins the integrity of the game. Wait a minute, did you hear what I said there? That's not something I hear anyone talk about when this is brought up. And to be honest, who really brings up voice chat anymore from what I can tell? Nobody talks about atmosphere. Do you think that, in a horror game, when you are trying to have the experience of being in a scary movie, that atmosphere matters? Do you think that if a game pours endless artistic value into the way a game looks and sounds and feels, that atmosphere should matter? Well then, I would argue, the game is better, even as Survivor, without voice. But, but, you may say, the game is not balanced around this, but to be honest, it's not balanced around voice either. Have you ever heard the sentiment, Swif, or teams of survivors on voice, beats killer, beats solo queue? I think a lot of people like to say this sentiment is stupid and pretend they're higher than this, but just because it isn't the end-all be-all always true truth of the game, just because it doesn't change how every game ends, doesn't mean it doesn't have a large impact on the balance and design of the game. There is some truth to it, and that's bad. Now, I've just barely seen this topic start to creep up recently, and I don't want to get too into this because I don't want this video to get derailed as more of a suggestion to fixes than an in-depth look at issues, but I'll present it to you like this. Why is there only one Q type? Why is there no casual or competitive Q? They're both just lumped up with each other. I'd argue that maybe, like the endless store of consumable items, it does add to the charm of the game a little, but more so it adds to the confusing and hopeless vibe I mentioned at the beginning of the video. And as cute as that is for the vibe of the game to have when the lore mimics this, it's not good for it. I think both of these issues could be addressed by this. What if there was a separate currency for ranked and unranked, so you didn't have to constantly sweat for items if you weren't competitive, but could all you want if you were? Moreover, what if there was voice in competitive? Initially, a long time ago, my thoughts were that there shouldn't be any way to do swift and competitive, but I imagine this system could still be abused. But to be honest, even that would be better than what we have now. There is just absolutely no connective logic to the way this game is designed, but damn if I still don't love it. Oh, oh gosh, what am I doing? Why am I starting to sound like I'm ending the video? No, 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 contraire. We haven't even talked about the community, and oh my, what a community it is. Although, to talk about the community, I think I have to get into the gameplay loops that Dead by Daylight's design leads towards. So we may not know what the actual objective of the match is, but we have a pretty good idea. Killers are trying to kill or hunt or whatever these poor little survivors, and the survivors want none of it, and they're trying to leave, alongside some other stuff or whatever. Maybe they're sticking around for some other stuff first. Well, in order to get out, these little survivors gotta repair five of seven generators, then open the exit gates, then walk out. 
Unless all but one of them dies or leaves or something, but we'll get to that. Killers, on the other hand, gotta stab and smack them a bunch, and after that they aren't typically expected to let these people bleed out, and most times they can't really finish them off. They gotta do this weirdo stuff I think was inspired by a scene from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where they hoist them up and put them on a hook. And once they're on the hook, these scary little arms form, and they try to stab the survivor, and the survivor says Yamate Kudasai, and if they don't get help, then they get Olafed. Now, that sounds fine on paper, but once you look at the details of that, the real issues start to pop up. Survivors can be hooked two times and still live, but they will always die on their third hook. But, survivors can also die on their first hook, so long as they stay there long enough. And wouldn't you know it, in a game of hide-and-seek, it's not so easy to hide when the seeker is right there waiting for you. Behold, camping. Yes, the final evolution of man is to send death threats to each other over puppy guarding. There's also another thing we need to bring up here before we talk in depth about camping. Let's put it like this. Whenever the survivor's time is being gobbled up by one survivor, the other survivors are doing their jobs. So if there are four survivors, and you're messing around with one, the speed of the other survivor's objectives being completed is about a 3 on the scale of 0 to 4. Now imagine that there were only three survivors. That speed might be a two on the scale of zero to four. Or if there were two, you get the point. So doesn't that make sense then, that instead of screwing around with every survivor some, it would be in the killer's best interest to kill someone as early as possible. Behold, the other great sin in the survivor's book of deadly sins, tunneling. I'm sure you're curious what my stance is on these aspects of the game. How would I sum it up? may be like this. The game designers can very evidently see what the game has become. Honestly, I feel like it's because of these two strategies that there's so much debate about what actually constitutes a win in the world of DVD. And this is a major failing in the design of the game. And at this point, in some ways, it may feel like there isn't a ton that can be done to fix it because the game was designed in a way so oriented towards these outcomes. And while the devs are taking steps to remedy this, some better than others, the complaints from players are endless, meaning that either the problem isn't nearly fixed, or the community is a bunch of whiny babies. And as for me, I think both. I think it was foolish to make the game this way in the first place, and I think the devs need to really double down and fix it in a meaningful way, not through perks. But, before I get to my opinions on that, I want to address the community. If you complain about camping and tunneling, but don't bring anti-camp or anti-tunnel perks, you need to just shut up. Honestly, you need to touch grass so badly. You are genuinely so annoying and stupid and awful and gosh, you need to stop playing the game. Me personally, I don't think camping and tunneling are that fun for the game or that skillful. But if I don't bring perks to counter it, I should not be upset with the killer for taking that route. If you lose to it, you need to take steps to work around it and counter it. If you play every game without perks to deal with camping or tunneling, and yet you get all feisty in the endgame chat and tell the killer they're a loser just for beating your ass with a dumb strategy, find a different game. This one clearly isn't your thing. If you load up the game and decide to play killer or survivor, you are free to do what you want in the match. If someone isn't okay with it, they can pound salt. It is their fault for playing the game still and their fault for actively not bringing perks that counter a playstyle they supposedly hate so much, and their fault for being so bad as to lose to it. Oh, and to address what many consider the third sin of the trifecta, slugging? No, shut up. Slugging isn't nearly as bad as the other two. It's genuinely just a part of the game, and you gotta get used to it. Literally, there are so many perks to counter it, and, and, if you want slugging to go away so bad, stop complaining about the anti-slug update. Either let that happen, or never say, nice slug, in the endgame chat ever again. You can't have both. I get that just because it's a fix doesn't mean that it has to be the right fix, but it's your fault for complaining so much about honestly a non-issue. Slugging isn't fun, but neither is any of the stuff you do to the other side. Screw you! Let them make unbreakable base kit, you pleb. I want to see Mori's at the end of every game. Oh, but I wanted to really quickly say something pretty polarizing. I want you to understand that when I say this, I do think that there should be a lot to make up for this. 
Loops should be nerfed or something. Pallets shouldn't be so ridiculous. Swift as a whole should be less oppressive. Something. But if I had the reins of DVD, I personally would make there no timer for how long someone can stay on hook, and would only make stages progress with subsequent hookings. I think this would greatly help the health of a game. Sure, that completely eliminates camping as a strategy, and you could argue that this would be too strong for survivors, but in healthy gameplay loops, the timer on hooks isn't even an issue. The only time that the timer comes up is in awful gameplay scenarios. And admittedly, a lot of those scenarios are due to survivors being too strong in other ways. But I think with the right balance, this could actually make the game a lot more fun. Getting hooked would never end up as a death sentence immediately at the beginning of a match, and survivors would still be incentivized to get you off the hook sooner so you can go back to doing gens. This would absolutely promote killers playing in a healthy way. All you have to do is buff killers or nerf survivors in some other ways, and this would completely immediately be good for the game. And if you disagree, I better not see you ever complaining about camping again! I want it removed! But if it's in the game, then people can do it! Gosh, it's so easy to BM the DVD community. I used to genuinely say I was in a tie for the worst gaming community I had ever witnessed. But after playing more recently, like within the last year or so, holy cow has it changed from what it used to be. It still 100% has the awful, horrible, deplorable people I've been complaining about, but it also has the sweetest, kindest, most big-hearted sweetie pies I've ever seen. You could genuinely face camp some of these sweethearts, and in the endgame chat, after getting 3k points, they'll say GG. Which has led me to a realization. Because I used to be used to the exact opposite. You'd hook someone, walk to the literal other side of the map, stare into the corner, DC from the game, unplug your computer, throw it in the ocean, fly into space, and still get called a camping piece of human trash. And then when I ran into these kind souled people, who can get tunneled out immediately and still say you play well, that's when it hit me. I want you to listen close, because this is the most important thing anyone will ever tell you about Dead by Daylight. You ready? What you do in the match has absolutely no effect on how the other side will treat you in the endgame chat. Much like some other games have false RNG, the algorithm that determines what players say in the endgame chat is actually predetermined upon loading into the match. That guy you never hit a second time and intentionally let out of the gates? Nice camp, loser! See you in hell! That poor Meg you decided to hook 12 seconds into the match and proceeded to set up seven bear traps all within the near vicinity, after which you stared into her soul until she left this mortal coil? GG, well played, good luck in next. Your actions, as much as people will pretend they do, have no influence on how people will treat you. Dead by Daylight has specifically four types of players. Players who won't type anything to you, players who can't type anything to you, players who would tell you to go die, and players who genuinely want to be your friend. There are no other players. Tag yourself. For those of you who like to complain in the endgame chat, I have a sick build you have to try. Here is my guide. Step 1, equip these perks. Kinship, off the record, decisive strike, unbreakable. Step 2, never type again. Step 3, if steps 1 and 2 fail, uninstall the game. This guide is guaranteed to make you a better human being. I feel like I need a section here for just a random assortment of nitpicks. Like, these are actual issues, but it's hard to fit them into a section. Intermission stopped! Uh, first of all, why are there perks that give blood points? Why are there perks that affect anything outside the match itself at all? In fact, why are there add-ons that make killers worse? At least with that one, it's somewhat understandable in that people want extra challenge, but if I prefer that stuff to be left to glitz and stuff. Can we keep the perks and add-ons to, like, things that benefit you, given that's what all the other ones do, and that's kind of the point of them at all? Like, say I'm having a tournament, and all that matters are kills, kind of like MMR. Does that mean perks like No One Left Behind are just automatically worse? Because surely they made the perk worse in order to give it a blood point bonus, right? I mean, 
That really just triggers my OCD. I love running off meta stuff, not because it's less powerful, but because it's perceived as less powerful and typically unorthodox. I don't want to be hindered, I want to be creative. Either you balanced the perk in such a way it didn't need the blood point bonus, or it's just worse than the other perk subjectively and you're admitting it. I hate that. To be honest, to riff off that, the perk design is an absolute mess. And it used to be even worse. There used to be a perk that literally only gave more blood points. There used to be a perk that was just objectively, and I mean objectively, just another perk but worse. There used to be a perk that was so damn good for Swift, but so useless for solo queue, it felt like it broke the game. Objective of obsession, I will never forgive you. So to address the whole what is a win thing, personally I like to look at it most in the kills versus escapes way. Because I think that's what the point of the game should be, that's the most tangible thing. And you also have an even amount of scoring opportunities given you have four survivors, so it's never really too confusing. Oh, and also, I consider the hatch an actual escape. Now, I know that may be controversial, but given that killers already tend to get more kills on average, I think that this just kind of balances things out. And personally, I don't like the way that a lot of the gameplay loops lean into this. Like, the amount of slugging and stuff, like, especially near the end, that actually leads to getting a 4K is annoying. I want the 4K, I just don't like the idea that in order to do that the best way possible, you have to make the game not fun for people. I just think that games should be designed in a way where the best way to get an actual win outcome is something that is enjoyable. It's not fun to sit around, but again, you shouldn't get mad at someone for doing the thing that is most likely going to mean they win. It is your job to do something about it or to play a different video game. Honestly though, to kind of continue that thought somewhat, yeah, the game used to be terrible, and it still has many, many flaws. But, Dead by Daylight is 100% having a character arc that basically is the exact opposite of most games I know. Every update, it just gets better and better. I know people like to make jokes about what Bill Perk will be made base kit next, but I think so far it's all been really healthy for the game. Specifically because camping and tunneling and slugging are both not fun as well as constantly whined about by the community. It absolutely needs to be dealt with. Also, speaking of which, if you, in the endgame, say something akin to anyone can win insert killer sin here, so it doesn't really count as a win, one of two things is true, even by your own logic. Either A, you are lying or wrong and you need to shut up, or B, Dead by Daylight is genuinely just in an unplayable state and you have no reason to be playing it and really should just expect camping and tunneling at this point. So you have no reason to be complaining given you should have expected this and willingly decided to play the game. I really, really need to stop talking about this. I just can't stand hypocrites and people who can't take a loss. Oh gosh, I just remembered. Yet another thing here to be miffed about that pertains to both the game design and the community. As before, let's start with being upset with the developers. Why, 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 why does this abomination exist? No, no, that's a stupid question. Let me ask a genuine one. Why won't you nerf her? I get that her kill rate is the lowest in the game, but that is across all ranks. Also, that doesn't even factor in her play rate. That statistic, her having the lowest kill rate, is genuinely meaningless given the myriad of issues I just mentioned. The only time win rate should ever be considered is when looking at the highest rank of online play when considering play rate alongside it. This killer is genuinely, without a doubt, busted. I played a game the other night where I did not blink a single time and I got eight hooks, two players each, intentionally, before they let one girl die on hook 
and proceeded to follow me around the map. See, that's something DVD players do when they're losing. They give up and make friends, which is cute. I'm, I'm bunny trailing. She's ridiculous. I know my little anecdote with the joke there doesn't really mean anything to this, but her power is absolutely bonkers. And her downsides, like her speed, do not even slightly make up for how busted her power is. She basically invalidates the entirety of the game's design. Pallets? Nah. Windows? Nope. Traversing the map? Easy. Chasing down survivors? Cake. Not to mention the design of so many perks are so oriented in such a way that she specifically uses them light years better than anyone. And what do they do about this? They nerf the perks, not her. Here, just a little heads up to all game designers. Stop changing game mechanics around characters that break the game. Change the characters, you morons. Armor didn't need nerfs. Brig did. These perks don't need nerfs. Nurse does. And to all the simpletons in the forums, Oh, I cannot believe the things I've read online. So many slime lords have crawled out of the recesses of hell specifically to lie blatantly to our faces online. And the things they've said are deplorable. I hate to repeat such words, even if not verbatim, but I will utter these curses but a single time. I apologize in advance. Nurse isn't overpowered. She takes skill. Ugh. Yuck. Oh. oh gosh, it hurts. I'm sorry. How can a mortal say such villainy? I would like to apologize to my viewers. This is my apology video. I did not mean the things I said. The context I was using those words in was as a quote, citing something others had said. But that doesn't mean it's okay that I said it. I'm sorry link to my Patreon and buy it. If you are one of the subhumans that thinks there's anything balanced about Nurse, or that the modicum of skill needed to play her constitutes the power level at all, please do not ever communicate again. Our mortal plane does not need your input. Spare us. I hear being a monk is quite a thing that people do. Some of them. I want to give a quick shout out to every survivor that goes back for your teammates when the gates are powered and 99 are opened. You are a true hero. This game is too cruel for you, but you make it a better place. Thank you. So you know how people used to say video games cause violence? Well, they don't. I mean, aside from an occasional weirdo that does something horrible supposedly because of video game, they really don't. Unless it's Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight is without a doubt, with 100% certainty in my mind, designed to create serial killers. I honestly don't know how you can come away from Dead by Daylight without wanting to kill people. Here, I have a really fun build for you to try. I want you to go out and spend an entire day playing this piece of garbage build. If you can do that without wanting to kill somebody, please see a local authority immediately because you are not human. If I'm playing killer and you want me to give you hatch or door or whatever, the best bet you have is to be running the perk diversion and if you're the last survivor or one of the last two, to throw the rock directly at me. I love that, that is so cute. Only the cutest survivor players throw rocks at the killers. I don't even know how you can kill a survivor after that without feeling terrible. It is genuinely difficult. Oh, uh, maybe y'all are curious as to what perspective this is all coming from. I mean, most of you know a lot about my stances on Overwatch at this point, and as well as my history, so I should probably provide some context here too. While I love playing Killer and Survivor, and personally actually enjoy Survivor more, I am more of a Killer main. I just recently underwent the horribly long process of unlocking just about every perk for both Killer and Survivor, but typically, when I play Killer, I stick to four different characters. Ghostface, Legion, Trickster, and my true main, Piggy. I can't really talk about rank too accurately like I did with Overwatch, because the game actually had a functional ranking system that people actually respected. Same people, at least. 
And so I could say I'm rank 1 in both Killer and Survivor, but nobody cares about that at this point. Not even the devs give an MMR as separate. The MMR isn't even visible, so I can't even tell you what mine is. I don't want to pretend I'm cracked at the game either. Maybe I'm good or bad for my amount of playtime. But I'm sure at this point I'm somewhere between tearing new players to ribbons without even trying, to the point where I absolutely feel terrible, and wanting to smash my head into the wall after playing against players with trillions of hours all running meta perks and items and bringing me to the farm maps or Ormond every single game. My best claims to fame have to be that I reached rank 1 with only Pig using only garbage perks like Spies from the Shadows and Hangman's Trick. And mind you, this was back when Pig was awful, and survivors were light years more powerful than they are now. My second claim to fame would be that I also reached rank 1 with Survivor around the same time, only solo queuing and not running a single meta perk. But to be honest, Survivor ranking system is so forgiving, it barely felt like doing anything. But yeah, playing through the entire cast of killers after maining Pig my entire career was eye-opening. Gosh, you b****s are privileged. I hope you know that us near to the bottom do not have the same plights as you. People can really say to killers like, Why did you tunnel? I never ever tunnel or camp or slug and I get 4k every game! And then go off and play Starstruck Nurse. The lack of self-awareness is astonishing. Intermission Nova! I already touched on this earlier, but after spending some time away from the script and coming back to it, I want to complain more about the community. What a genius play, right? I mean, I have terrible memory, but I'm pretty certain I literally said recently I wanted to stop whining about them, right? Too bad. I was just going about my day and I realized, what other game has people constantly policing others on how to play the game? Okay, that was a bad way to word it. Uh, here's a much better way to phrase it. What other game has people constantly policing the opposing players to play the game a certain way? Yeah, now that's a little more baffling. I really don't know of any other games like that. That would be like if I were to just immediately complain in match chat the second I saw the enemy team had a Widow, because I thought she takes no brain power and that's OP. Actually, a more accurate analogy would be that if I was playing Overwatch 1, and I was playing Zen, and the enemy was playing like Doom Sombra, and just f turning me into paste. And instead of switching off Sen, I just told the enemy team to unalive themselves for playing such overpowered characters. That's actually almost exactly what the DVD experience is like. It makes absolutely no sense. Again, I think the game should continue to get patched to make playing in fun ways way more viable than playing it in what is considered scummy ways. But if the game is the way it is, you should either stop playing it Counter the scum, or at the very least, expect it and not complain, and certainly don't threaten people's lives. I, I, gotta, I gotta stop. I wanted to touch on something kind of unique to DVD. The game is like, really... would mysterious be the right word? And I'm not talking about the lore, but the fact this aspect of the game lines up with the same vibe the lore gives is pretty cool. But what I mean is like... Okay, many games have special little techniques that take varying levels of mastery in order to perform, and ranging from fairly easy if you've been told how to do it, to incredibly difficult even for the diehards. Alongside this, there is hidden game knowledge that is also really interesting. While some can be purely cosmetic, like the golden toolbox easter egg, there are also some useful things, such as the lights blinking showing where the generators are. And yet, let me emphasize this, the sheer amount of actual useful info in the game that you cannot find a guide for or tooltip for anywhere within the game is staggering. And while a lot of this is very neat and cool and adds to the aesthetic of the game, I fear that a good portion of it is detrimental. Often newer players, and I don't mean absolute babies, I mean just like a bit newer than most, will not know how to deal with certain killers or certain situations. As an example, this great video right here details how original Freddy was either incredibly overpowered or incredibly underpowered, depending on how much game knowledge you had. For a new player, Freddy essentially slowed the game down to a crawl and made him unbearable to deal with. But for veteran players and people in the know, a simple missed skill check was all it took to render his power not only useless, but even a hindrance from just being an M1 killer. 
While I think it would be stupid to argue that the game should be designed and balanced around new players, giving new players absolutely zero info and tips does make the game a lot harder to actually get into for the casual new player. I honestly think that just some little pointers for new players, beyond just these tiny tips you may or may not get all of on the loading screen, will go a long way. And speaking of which, notice how the counter to Old Freddy was so polarizing? Well, it may be an extreme example, but I've noticed a common theme with Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight is based around the concept of horror movies, right? And within the genre of horror, the way things often work out is that some evil force, whether some guy or some eldritch abomination, wants to do horrible things, and very often has some sort of power in order to torment the other characters. This can range from being almost unkillable, to being a real hot- I mean spooky dude. And it can be a trope to deal with these people in certain ways. Like, uh, in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, they tried to stay awake as long as possible, because Freddy couldn't get them while awake, for the most part. Well, this idea of having counters to killers' abilities is translated pretty directly into DVD but often plays out in a strange way. Let me lay out some examples. These may or may not be true currently, but each of them either remains true today or was true at some point. The counter to Plague is to never cleanse yourself of her sickness. The counter to Twins is to never remove Victor from your back. The counter to Pinhead is to never open the box, but to hold it. The counter to Legion is to never heal. The counter to Nurse is to never play Dead by Daylight. The counter to every killer I play is to hold W. Okay, I'm kidding with that last one, kinda not really. But do you see what's going on here that's strange? The devs have worked in counters to several killers, but oddly enough, the top tier players often do not interact with these counters, as they all have some downside. And robbing the killer of their potential power is the true counter. This while maybe intentional, maybe, is really counterintuitive for the average player. You genuinely can have people telling you to commit die specifically because you used the in-game counter to a killer. And while I think they've addressed several of these, it's funny to me that it seems to keep happening. Oh, and uh, really quick, speaking about making downsides for things too strong, uh, what the hell is perk balance? I just want to read to you what a couple perks do, just as a thought experiment. Off the record. Once you are unhooked or escape from the hook, off the record activates for 80 seconds. This perk and its effects are disabled once the exit gates are powered. While off the record is active, your aura will not be shown to the killer, grunts of pain caused by injuries are reduced by 100%, gain the endurance status effect. Technician. The noises caused by your repairs and their hearing distance are reduced by 8 meters. On a failed repair skill check, the following effects happen. The generator explosion will be prevented. The generator loses progress as usual. An additional 3% progress is lost. Unbreakable. Grants the ability to fully recover from the dying state once per trial. Increases dying recovery speed by 35%. Calm spirit. Reduces the chances of alerting woodland creatures by 100%. Allows you to to overcome the urge to scream. Allows you to open chests and cleanse slash bless totems silently, but at 30% reduced speed. Why? Why do these awful perks have downsides when these perks do stuff that is literally game-saving? Oy, oy, oy. All of this leads to the big question of how do I feel about Dead by Daylight? If you ask while I'm not playing the game, I might BM it a bit, but I'd probably express a desire to play it, at least if you asked recently. If you asked while I was playing the game, a lot of the time I'd probably say it's terrible and I hate it and I don't want to keep playing it. But I think when I actually take that question seriously, I have more nuanced thoughts on the game. I think Dead by Daylight could be pretty great, but there's a few things preventing it from doing so. What draws me to the game is a few things. For one, Obviously, it's pretty great as a game to get into if you're in the Halloween mood, which I personally need given how hard life has made it to focus on fun, happy things recently. Being able to play as characters from spooky franchises and then go and watch their movies, or maybe even more so vice versa, is honestly such a cool experience. But I think normally my biggest draw to DVD is a shortage of a certain type of gameplay that the market just seems to have forgotten. 
Trying to constantly mind game your opponent and make reads on them while managing multiple factors at once is genuinely such a cool, fun experience. And while I often find it in other games, it's often overshadowed by mechanics I just don't find fun or have much respect for, like gaming. And honestly, while DVD is one of the only games focused around this type of gameplay, both the illogical design of the devs, alongside the illogical attitude of the community, often finds a way of killing this vibe. The devs have to start touching up some of these flaws that make the game so difficult to bear, and I think they really are, which is a great sign. It may take forever to address even most of them, but I will never fault the development team for making progress towards fixing a game, even if slowly. And for the community, I agree that the big three genuinely make the game less fun. But I think this attitude where players refuse to counter it and continue to harass others for their own lack of actually doing anything about it makes the game much harder to enjoy. If you read through the descriptions of the emblems at the end of the match, it becomes evident that at least the devs think the game is about a myriad of different factors, and you're being tested on each of them at once. But the attitude of many players serves to discount and discredit any success players make in these other regards. I don't play Killer because I want to see how many times I can outpredict someone during the same loop for the billionth time. I play Killer to do this little looping game, while keeping track of the movements of other players, trying to play space in order to keep them off gens, and going for cool sneaky plays. As fun as 1v1ing at Cowshed is, that isn't the whole game. And it shouldn't be either. Almost as much as staring at some poor Dwight on hook shouldn't be your entire game. I really, really like DVD. Even right now I want to play it. Trying to make this video instead of playing it was difficult. I'm sure I'll get tired of it at some point and stop playing and come back to it eventually, ad infinitum. But for now, while I give the game a really low rating on the game design philosophy integrity scale, I still love it, and I'm going to keep playing it lots. I just hope that the game can really figure out what it wants to be, and the community can accept it. Until then, please continue to boot my snoot. Hey, this is Seto. I'll, I'll try to keep this short as usual. You know how I never, ever actually keep it short. Um, I wanted to thank you for watching the video. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry that the production level was a little lower than usual. Life really, really got in the way this time. I'm trying to graduate. I wanted to get it out before Halloween and I kept stalling like an idiot. Um, and there's just a lot that I wanted to do here, so when I came to the actual editing part, that's where I, uh, had to not do as good as usual. I hope that the amount of extra things I brought to this video, though, uh, made it worthwhile. Um, I wanted to, uh, thank you all so much just for all the support that I've gotten. Again, the Discord link in the bio. As long as everyone whose YouTube video I either mention or whose, uh, uh, Twitch, uh, and all the Twitch streamers I played against. Uh, so lots of lots of links down there, uh, and also my uh, Patreon and Discord. Did I mention the Discord? I did so forget for you. So. Well, uh, I uh, I love you all, and just thank you so much for uh, keeping keeping up the love. Uh, please show all the other people I've linked love, and uh, thanks for being so good. See ya. Oh, and I almost forgot I have a Twitch, too. Please go watch me on Twitch. I'm gonna uh, stream there. Something, maybe. Th that. Something. Yeah, hello. There it is. Go look at it or something. Bye. Thank you so, 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 so much to Aeolus Smurf. A Aeolus is Surfer. Aeolus is Surfer. Aeolus is Surfer. Aeolus is. Illus is Illus I SMS Surfer. Illus is Smurfer.